October 30th, 1943. For four years from the very start of this conflict, we've seen the laws of war and conflict broken with impunity. Last week, the United Nations created a body to investigate such crimes by their enemies. This week, they draw up the path for how to prosecute them. The Axis perpetrators seem hellbent on helping them out by documenting their own crimes in excruciating detail, including letting themselves be photographed in the act of murder. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. Last week, we saw how all Operation Reinhardt extermination factories, except Auschwitz-Birkenau, had seized operations with the evidence of the mass murders being hidden under farms. At Auschwitz, train after train continued to bring new victims to be enslaved or murdered. One of those transports were the Roman Jews deported from Italy the previous week. The liquidation of the Minsk ghetto was completed as the last inhabitants were murdered in mobile gas vans outside of the city. The United Nations War Crimes Commission was set up to investigate the atrocities committed by Germany on the front lines and in their occupations. The Royal Air Force launched a firestorm over Kassel, killing 9,000. In British India, Archie Wavell became the new viceroy and vowed to deal with the famine in Bengal. High on his list of priorities was to gain a personal picture of the situation. So on October 26, Wavell lands in Calcutta. When he arrives back in Delhi, he will note in his diary, returned from three days at Calcutta, in the course of which I saw all the ministries, a number of officials and non-officials, went round the streets of Calcutta by night to see how the destitutes were sleeping and by day to see them being fed, and spent one day in the Kontai district of Midnapore, which is supposed to be one of the areas most affected by the famine. I found things on the whole much as I had expected from what I had read and heard. Widespread distress and suffering, not as gruesome as the Congress papers would make it out, but grim enough to make official complacency surprising. He immediately sets about to find relief. I saw all the ministers yesterday evening, told them they must get the destitutes out of Calcutta into camps, which should have been done long ago got them to accept a major general and staff to help with the transport of supplies and the assistance of the army generally. I also urged them to get on with their rationing schemes and put before them the proposal to take Calcutta out of the Bengal food problem and feed it from the outside. This last proposal seemed to meet with some doubts, but I am advised it is the only possible resolution that will restore confidence in the rural areas and bring prices down. It's a reversal of his predecessor's policy, which has focused on what little relief has been given solely on Calcutta. Changes notwithstanding, Wavell is not very confident of improvement. Truly pretty hectic and distressing days, I wonder if my intervention will do any good. The ministry is obviously a very weak one, and the acting governor, Rutherford, rather disappointed me. No fire in him. A multitude of political issues stand in Wavell's way. There's widespread disinterest both among British colonial officials and many Indian politicians, to not mention 10 Downing Street in London, where we have seen British Prime Minister Winston Churchill express direct opposition to offering relief. Next week, Wavell will meet with his longtime friend Hridya Nath Kunzru, president of the National Liberal Federation political party, who has been traveling extensively in Bengal during the famine. He was obviously very upset at the conditions in Bengal and also at the lack of civic spirit of his countrymen in Bengal and the inefficiency of the Bengal government, who are still more concerned in their politics and rivalries than with the famine. And while the mortal drudgery of politics continue in Bengal and Moscow, it is the international politics of how to deal with the mortal policy of Nazi Germans once the war is won that is on the agenda. British Foreign Minister Anthony Eden, U.S. Secretary of State Cordell Hull, Soviet Minister of Foreign Affairs Vyacheslav Molotov, and Soviet de facto dictator Joseph Stalin, are, among other things, settling how to deal with the prosecution of Nazi criminals once the war has been won. The meeting results in a laundry list of how to purge Europe from Nazism and fascism and how to deal with the borders of the German Reich. 
Significantly, Stalin formally agrees that a war with Germany will only end with Germany's unconditional surrender. We also issue a public declaration on atrocities. The United Kingdom, the United States, and the Soviet Union have received from many quarters evidence of atrocities, massacres, and cold-blooded mass executions which are being perpetrated by the Hitlerite forces in the many countries they have overrun and from which they are now being steadily expelled. At the time of the granting of any armistice to any government which may be set up in Germany, those German officers and men and members of the Nazi party who have been responsible for or have taken a consenting part in the above atrocities, massacres, and executions will be sent back to the countries in which their abominable deeds were done in order that they may be judged and punished according to the laws of these liberated countries and of the free governments which will be created therein. Lists will be compiled in all possible details from all these countries, having regard especially to the invaded parts of the Soviet Union, to Poland and Czechoslovakia, to Yugoslavia and Greece, including Crete and other islands, to Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, France, and Italy. Thus, the Germans who take part in wholesale shootings of Italian officers or in the execution of French, Dutch, Belgian or Norwegian hostages or of Cretan peasants, or who have shared in the slaughters inflicted on the people of Poland or in the territories of the Soviet Union, which are now being swept clear of the enemy, will know that they will be brought back to the scene of their crimes and judged on the spot by the peoples whom they have outraged. Let those who have hitherto not imbrued their hands with innocent blood beware lest they join the ranks of the guilty, for most assuredly the three allied powers will pursue them to the uttermost ends of the earth and will deliver them to their accusers in order that justice may be done. Thus, the United Nations War Crimes Commission, founded last week, now has a formal path to prosecution through the national judicial in said countries. When news of the declarations from the meeting reached Germany, Reichspropaganda Minister Josef Goebbels is not impressed, noting that this conference ended with a communique that is a mixture of Bolshevik and League of Nations phraseology. Not only is Goebbels unimpressed, the atrocities continue unabated, as does the discovery of them. After the Red Army liberates Dnipropetrovsk on October 25th, they find that of the 20,000 Ukrainian Jews who have lived here before the war, only 15 have survived German occupation. Further west in Ukraine, Beredichev is still in German hands. Before the war, half of the town's population, 30,000, were Jewish. This week, the very few of them who are still alive are murdered. In Dvinsk, Latvia, of the 11,000 Latvian Jewish locals, only a few hundred remain. They are now deported to the concentration camp Kaiserwald. Only 20 of the 11,000 will survive the war. On October 25th, 980 Dutch Jews from the Vesterbork transit camp arrive in the Nazi cattle cars to Auschwitz, and on the 27th, a transport with 841 more. The majority of them are murdered on arrival, the rest enslaved. Few of them will see the end of the war. In the Kaunas ghetto in occupied Lithuania, at the beginning of the week, 4,000 inhabitants are deported into a slave camp outside the city. On the 26th, another 2,800 inhabitants are taken into deadly slavery in camps in occupied Estonia. The same day, Oswald Pohl, head of the SS main economic and administrative office, issues a letter to several of the concentration camp commandants across the Reich and occupied territories, among others Auschwitz, Lublin, Warsaw, Kaunas, Großrosen, and Mauthausen. The concentration camps have in the last two years become of decisive importance to the war effort. Hence, all efforts must be made to not only keep up, but constantly increase performance. The measures taken should focus on maintaining the work capacity and health of the prisoners. The first goal is that we reduce work incapacity to one-tenth of the prisoners. Paul goes on to make suggestions for improvements, but the first step remains selection of victims for enslavement who have the physical potential to survive the torturous circumstances of producing for the German war machinery. Anyone else is expendable and shall die. On October 30th, a transport of 1,000 French and non-French Jews from the transit camp at Drancy arrives at Auschwitz. 284 men and 103 women are selected as able-bodied slaves. 
The remaining 613 men, women, and children are gassed to death on arrival. Photos that will later be discovered taken during many of these atrocities often show the murderers displaying pride and pleasure of their deeds. In the Far East, a series of these most famous photos of this kind is taken this week. Leonard Stifleet is a 27-year-old soldier from Australia born of Dutch migrant parents. In 1941, he enlisted in the 2nd Australian Imperial Force to help provide for his younger siblings after their bread-earning mother died. The same year, he got engaged with his girlfriend, Clarice Lane. In 1942, he volunteered for special reconnaissance work and was trained as a radio operator. In January 1943, he was sent to New Guinea as part of a reconnaissance and infiltration group to penetrate behind enemy lines and incite resistance against the Japanese occupiers among the local Papuans. After a 500-mile trek through jungle and over mountains, they reached their target area around Aitape in July. The party counted 66 native New Guinean bearers, Stifleet, Privates Patival and Riharing, Ambanese members of the Dutch East Indies military, and Commanding Officer Sergeant Staverman of the Royal Netherlands Navy. The intelligence part of the mission progressed well with regular radio contact to their base, but attempts to recruit Papuan resistance proved more difficult. By September, they were encountering hostility from groups of Japanese-friendly Papuans, and Staverman was killed in an ambush. With most of their bearers scattered, Stifleet had to bury his heavy radio equipment and burn his codebooks as they tried to escape. Two weeks ago, they were ambushed again by 100 Papuans. After a brief firefight, the three men are overpowered and captured. Handed over to the Japanese, they were tortured for information. On October 24th, Stifleet, Patiwal, and Riharing are forced to march down to Aitape Beach. There, they are blindfolded and made to kneel in front of a crowd of Japanese soldiers and local civilians. Their death has been ordered by Admiral Michiaka Kamada of the Imperial Japanese Navy. One Japanese officer, Yasuno Chikao, draws his sword and beheads Stifleet. Two other unidentified soldiers behead Patiwal and Rihari. Now, Chikao has a Japanese private photograph the executions as a souvenir. In February next year, 1944, copies of the photographs will be found on a dead Japanese soldier's body. From then on, the photos will be reprinted in newspapers, magazines, and books over and over again across the world. And already during this war, they will arguably become the most famous illustrations of Japanese war crimes against POW. While other such photos have emerged depicting similar acts in China going back to the beginning of the war there in 1937, and we know of many, many cases of executions in this way of Allied soldiers, these are the only known Japanese trophy execution photos depicting Allied soldiers. Although when first published, Leonard Stifleet will be misidentified, he will eventually become tragically famous in death. In Germany this week is an already famous man who is prosecuted with prejudice for telling a joke. Robert Dossé's career as a successful comedian, singer, and actor began in the 1920s. By the 1930s, he was filming with the big stars of the time and soon became a household name in Germany. A political comedian by nature, the rise of the Nazis proved problematic for him. Like many performers vying to hold on to their trade, he tried to join the enemy by entering the NSDAP, the Nazi party, but let his membership lapse after only a few months in 1933, and despite being pressed to rejoin, he chose not to and tried to continue working without party affiliation. He was able to continue performing on stage, but from 1936, the film roles he was offered became smaller and smaller. Finally, in 1939, he was taken off the list of Nazi-permitted film actors. In 1940, he had to retire from the stage, and in 1941, he was drafted into the Wehrmacht as a driver. Throughout, he never lost his sense of humor and didn't shy away from making fun of the Nazi party, even imitating the Führer in public. In March this year, while on leave in Hamburg in a bar, he tells a Hitler joke to some friends. Liberally translated, it goes like this. So Hitler comes to a town, and as he's parading in, instead of flowers, a little girl offers him a handful of dust. 
Perplexed, the Führer asks what he is supposed to do with it. The girl answers. Everybody says that everything will get better when the Führer bites the dust. Now someone in the bar who overhears the joke reports Dossé to the Gestapo who put him under surveillance and begin reading his mail. In September this year, he writes to his friend Eddie Haase and wonders when will this idiocy end? For that, the Gestapo arrest him and on October 8th, he is made an example, found guilty of damaging the war effort and sentenced to death. On October 29th, he is executed at the Berlin Plötzensee prison and subsequently struck from the credits of all the films he has ever acted in. A life under tyranny is a muted life where to stay alive even the most innocent thoughts about the state of the world are best kept unspoken and unwritten. For any critical mind, it's a vacuum of loneliness without beacons and role models and with an audience of no one. Thoughts that seem to be on now 15-year-old Anne Frank's mind this week in the third year of being locked in hiding in an attic in Amsterdam. Sometimes I think God is trying to test me, both now and in the future. I'll have to become a good person on my own without anyone to serve as a model or advise me. But it will make me stronger in the end. Who else but me is ever going to read these letters? Who else but me can I turn to for comfort? I'm frequently in need of consolation. I often feel weak, and more often than not, I fail to meet expectations. I know this, and every day I resolve to do better. Never forget. Mm -hmm.